Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. First note, disappointment. There's not going to be much gunpowder in this talk, I'm afraid, but there will be a lot of cannon. So, but first we start with an apology. When this talk was first suggested, I'd assumed I'd be able to spend more time researching new material at the National Archives. Well, that went well. <laughs> I've managed one whole week in the last year, which means that I'm a bit more dependent on secondary sources than I would like to be. And I want to introduce these three articles, which without them, I don't think I'm able to do this talk. However, I will be drawing on my own researches in the Ordnance Office papers, and I've got some new material relating to the chronology of the salvage work on the London, although, as I say, I think it's less complete than I would have liked. So, first I'll be covering the salvage work on the ship over 20 or 30 years after the sinking, and then the divers and salvagers concerned and their progress. Then I'll discuss the, a few of the surviving guns themselves, and then I'll finish up with some explanations of why the Ordnance spent so much time and money over many years fishing out the London's guns. So we'll start with part one, salvage. Nice showing what happens when a ship blows up at sea. So the story of the recovery of the London's guns starts on the 8th of March, 1665, when news reached London of the spectacular loss of the ships on the Thames, taking down with her a sizable proportion of the bronze guns in the English arsenals much to the chagrin of the Ordnance Office. Events moved quickly. On the 9th of March, the Ordnance received a letter from the Navy Board informing them that some of our number purpose, purpose to go down to the Rack of the London to see what may be done for the recovery of anything belonging to her and to see how they could cooperate on the recovery of the guns. So we'll start with a small diversion at this point. Two government departments were involved in the ownership of the Navy's ships. The ships themselves, with all their naval stores and equipment, came under the Navy board, but the guns and the other warlike stores belonged to the Ordnance Office, based at this time in the Tower of London and at Whitehall. So to put it plainly, the Navy was interested in recovering the ships equipment, the Ordnance in its hands. <clears throat> and in fact, the first guns had already been salvaged. Half a dozen pieces had been grabbed from parts of the London's quarter deck and loaded onto the nearest warships, the Royal Catherine and St George, and were already on the way to the Ordnance Wharf at Woolwich. And for good measure, the Ordnance later ordered a five pound award for those who had helped save the guns. So two salvage operations swung into action. One under the Navy to save what they could of the ship and the other by the Ordnance Office concentrating on the guns. And again, by the 9th of March 1665, the Ordnance were in touch with Robert Willis, instructing him to repair on board the ship London and see what guns are to be saved and give us a speedy account, followed by a promise of money to follow. Willis, originally from New England, was now based at Harwich, where he had been working for a decade recovering guns from the ship Liberty or Charles, lost on a nearby sandbank. His career is to be the subject of a new article by David Cressy, which will be coming out this summer in the Mariner's Mirror. And I know the night diving part of this also will be fascinated by the details of Willis's life and career that he's managed to uncover. From the 15th to the 18th of March, the ordnance clerks and divers and their hoys worked on the wreck. Diver Willis was issued with three prongs with the staves in them from the storekeeper at Deptford to use in his salvaging. However, the weather conditions deteriorated on the 18th and the ordnance wrote to Willis to forbear any further attendance to recover the guns of the London until the weather be more seasonable, while the Marshal Hoy was discharged from attending the wreck for the immediate future. After a few days delay, the salvage operation began again. The ordnance enlarged their team, sending the messenger aboard the Ketch Hind to find one Henry Gale seaman and to bring him to the office to be agreed with about diving for the ordnance on the London. And the ordnance papers give us tantalizing views of the operation. Early in April, they borrowed the Harridge Hoy, equipped with a davit and capstan, to help raise the gun. And we get more details from the references to a later diver operation, the recovery of guns from the Sorlings in 1669 for which the ordnance ordered 12 fathom of breaching rope and a pair of large tongs of iron for clasping 
of guns underwater, which was then to be returned after their use. And with these implements, a number of cast iron guns were raised and perhaps something similar was in use here. The operation continued through April and May. The ordnance now acquired two diving bells and ordered 40 tons of tar to waterproof the diving tubs. The weather was bad enough to limit the work to a few days every month. Late in May, there was another concentrated effort to graze guns when Major Bailey went down to the London Rack after the diver was employed from 26th to 29th of May. And he was back for a further five days in mid-June. And Bailey was still supervising work on the wreck from aboard the Coppersmith in August 1665. Just see these documents that Major Bailey has sent from aboard the Coppersmith. It seems by the end of the summer season, 18 guns had been raised. Now, the Coppersmith boat was retained by the ordnance over the winter of 1665 to 6, but it's hard to interpret some of the records. Were the payments to the summer or to new work? For example, the Master of the Hopeful was rewarded with five pounds for recovering five guns and their carriages, and it's not clear if this is part of the initial salvage or guns recovered over the winter. Another payment is to the 37 seamen employed on the London Rack. And it's just as you were saying, you'd like to know who was aboard the London. Well, at least you know the names of the men who helped to recover the, the items from the wreck, even if we don't know them. And it's, it's an impressive list of the men who were the first to work on the wreck so long ago. But these payments may mark the end of Robert Willis's involvement in the wreck. He was to be paid enough money to make his payments up to the 50 pounds he'd been promised. And this is the last reference I can find to his working in association with the London. Now, after this, there's a slight gap. At this point, we have the much repeated the plague, the great fire of London, the chores. So we think possibly the Ordnance Office had rather more to think about. Until we meet our next salver, a man with an impressive history of working famous wrecks, James Mall of Melgham in northeast Scotland. As early as spring 1656, Mall had formed a partnership with his fellow Scot, Alexander Lord Forbes, to work on wrecks in Swedish waters, including the Vasa. However, despite these commitments in Sweden in 1660, Mall petitioned King Charles II for the sole power for 31 years to fish up and recover all sunken ships, guns, etc., for the use of the Crown on the settlement of a salary and his charges, claiming that he had found out a new invention of working at 20 to 30 fathoms. Well, despite this approach to King Charles, Moll continued his work in Sweden. His main focus was on wrecks from near Gothenburg, but he also investigated the site of the Vasa, probably in 1663. But within days of the loss of the London, a gentleman in Edinburgh was already writing to a colleague with news of the salvage operation, but also that Mr Moll, Laird of Melgham, has a device by which he can stay six or eight hours underwater coming up to recover breath and is most willing and able to serve his majesty in recovering the guns of the London. However, during 1665 to 6, the Spanish Armada ship which sank in the harbour of Tobermory Bay in the Isle of Mull, whose salvage rights were held by the Duke of Argyll. Mull's time there was not very successful he recovered only a pair of bronze cannon, and the Duke complained how much constant care and repair his equipment was needing. When Moll informed the Duke that he'd been called away, Argyle quickly refined a replacement and sent him off. But it seems that the work that Moll had been called away to was the London, as there's a payment in the Ordnance Venture books on the 24th of September 1667 to James Moll for a bronze 24 pounder weighing 4,850 pounds raised from the London. And at present, I don't know the extent of the length of the time he worked there. And this is certainly an area for future research. And if you, you can see his signature right down at the bottom of that letter, it says Mall. And at this point, things get a little murkier, rather like the waters of the Thames. I make the cap to you to see if there's any more information in the records. But it does seem that sporadic work was carried out over the next few years. There were now several celebrity divers touting their new ideas and inventions around the wealthy wrecks of Europe, with several working on more than one famous wreck, the Vasa, the London, Tobermory, and later on the ships destroyed in the Dutch raids. 
Following that event in the summer of 1667, the Ordnance now had several more wrecks and burnt ships in whole waters to recover guns from. And it's not always clear exactly which wreck they're talking about in the records. However, there was still interest in the London, including a tantalizing reference to a Dutchman in 1671, employed to sweep and weigh the London's guns. But we don't yet as know his identity of the unnamed salver or whether he had any success. At the same time, there was a mysterious German who worked briefly at Tobermory, who was then followed there by the more famous and reliable Hans Albrecht von Trilben, who was another partner who was responsible for raising almost 50 guns from the Vasa in the 1660s. So either of these might be our mysterious Dutchman. However, there was certainly a Dutchman involved in the next team of divers to work this height. Again, details are hard to follow, except that clearly there was a falling out amongst the partners, but the story appears to be something like this. In 1679, William Harrington of London, Mariner, Cornelius Gelder and Samuel Souten of London, Merchants, formed a company to dive and raise guns from English wrecks. They then made a contract with Sir William Pritchard, Sir William Pritchard, a very wealthy merchant who supplied both the Navy and the Ordnance with rope, pitch and copper. And one of the wrecks they agreed to target together was the London. The consortium was certainly successful in recovering some of the guns, but sadly they were much less successful being paid for their work. The three original partners petitioned the Attorney General in 1680-81, stating their invention of several tools engines, the arguments to be brought without for the way and covering of ship guns and goods across the sea. And by this point, Harrington claimed to have raised seven brass guns from London, probably using large tongs. Matters had not been settled by November 1681, when the ordinance asked for clarification about it. Captain Richard Leake, the master gunner of England, was sent down to Woolwich and Rotherhithe to take a view of the brass guns lying upon Sir William Pritchard's wharf, which were formerly, according to a contract with him and William Harrington, recovered and landed out of the late London wreck. To cause some to be well searched and to take their numbers, natures, lengths, weights. In addition, they asked Sir William Pritchard for the true state of the agreement and the account between him and Harrington, and to consider how satisfaction may be made to the undertakers upon their contract. And then finally, the, there were asked details of two extra guns lately taken up out of the London wreck by Harrington and currently on a war for Rotherhithe. However, Captain's Leak visit did not clear the matter up, and more than 15 years later, in the 1690s, the former partners were still trying to get payment. In 1682, Sir William had been elected Lord Mayor of London, and perhaps he had other things on his mind. However, Harrington was not short of job offers, and the next we hear of him, he is in Tobermory, where he worked for three summers for King James II, who had reclaimed the salvage rights on the Armada ship. Harrington was successful in recovering a number of bronze guns, but not the Spanish treasure that the Duke and the King had both hoped to find. Well, this seems to have been the last concerted attempt to salvage guns from London at the time until more modern times. So perhaps now it's time to actually look at the surviving guns themselves. On, on this, I'm leaning heavily on the articles of my friend and Pasco, as I myself have only been able to see four of the guns. So the London government at the insistence of the Navy. As there were not enough new English bronze guns, her armament was a very mixed bag, including captured Dutch and French pieces and older English pieces. And this is typical of the later 17th century naval ship. Earlier in the 17th century, prestigious ships like Sweden's Vasa or England's Sovereign of the Seas were armed with specially designed and cast guns. However, late in the century, you find important ships which are now carrying very mixed armaments. Sweden's Krona, which like the London, blew up and exploded uh, in 1676, was armed with more than 101 bronze guns. The temporary salvage covered about 60 of them, but since, but since the 1980s, another 40 have been lifted one dating from as early as 1516 and the latest from 1661, with guns from Sweden, German states, Denmark and Spain. 
Denmark Stannebrog, another ship that blew up and exploded, lost during battle in 1710, carried 72 bronze pieces, and although subject to contemporary salvage, the more were recovered in the mid 19th century. Almost all the guns there are of Danish or origin, but they range in date from the late 16th to the 1670s. So again, this very mixed box. The London's, uh, <coughs> the London's armament fits neatly into this pattern, including the importance of contemporary salvage. Of the The London's armament. <clears throat> so what do we know about the guns of the London? The last total before she sank is an armament of 76 brass guns, as you can see here. 16 demi cannon, eight 24 pounders, 26 culverins, 24 demi culverins, and two minions. And here you can see the, the way they, they were arranged on the ship. Now, if we then work out what's been raised at the time and more recently, what might still be left on the river floor? First, the immediate salvage, the six quarter guns were removed in the first day. The demi culverin drakes and minions. So that's down to seven. Over the summer of 1665, we think 18 guns were lifted, seven demi culverins. So that's probably down to 52. In 1667, James Mull lifted up one Dutch 24 pounder. We don't know about the mysterious man in 1671 if he got anything, so we leave the total at 51. Harrington managed <clears throat> seven and then another two, so he got nine. We've got one raised by accident in 1961, two more in 1980, and then five in the 2000s, which leaves us with possibly 34. However, I think this may underestimate the guns raised at the time, particularly if the ordnance declined to pay for them, as appears to be the outcome of Harrington's attempts, and not to mention recovery of the last few hundred years, either accidentally or on purpose. Now, before we discuss the guns themselves, a little more about the use of bronze guns in the Navy. Until the 1640s, most of the guns aboard the fleet were bronze. However, at this time, the Navy was comparatively small and the life of a bronze gun could be very long indeed and usually outlasted the ships that they were mounted on. There have been about six gun founders working at two foundries in London casting bronze guns. But through the first half of the 17th century, the London foundries went into decline. Houndsditch, which had been founded in the reign of Henry VIII, closed in the 1630s, and Tower Foundry in 1650s. By 1665, there was only one founder of bronze guns left in Britain, George Brown of Horsemonde in the Weald. This meant that the ordnance could not replace lost bronze pieces quickly from new stock. To arm the increased size of the Navy in the 1640s and 1650s, Parliament had turned instead to iron guns, cast at the furnaces of the Weald in Kent and Sussex into more than one gun founder to supply them. By contrast, the Netherlands had about a dozen gun founders working in the 1660s in bronze foundries in seven cities and towns, as well as having access to established gun foundries and products from the gun foundry. On the other hand, their cast iron guns had to make the perilous journey across the seas from Sweden to the Netherlands. So bronze guns were still more common on Dutch ships than me. So back to the guns. We have six precious survivors, above the waters at least. When the Navy needed new bronze guns, it was the practice to melt down the old obsolete guns to provide the metal. So comparatively few bronze guns survive, and each of these can tell us something new. The largest guns aboard the London were the set of demi cannon on the gun deck, which fired a ball of 32 pound. As we shall see, they were among the newest of the guns, and we do have one of these survivors, cast by George Brown at Horsmonde, who we just mentioned. George was the third generation of the Browns to work in the Royal Gunfighter, they had served in this position since the days of Queen Elizabeth. 
and you may well just be able to make out at the bottom there the Commonwealth arms cast on the barrel showing it was cast in the 1650s. After the restoration, the ordinance paid its labourers to remove the offending crests and engraved CR over the scar, but this one escaped mutilation, and at present I think it's our only bronze piece to survive from Cromwell's time. Well, so far we may get more. Next in size are the 24 pounders, also on the main gun deck, which threw a shot of 24 pounds, obviously. Now, one of the most important changes in the 1660s was the introduction of large poundage guns into the Navy. Before that, English guns were all of a nominal system, the guns of names, cannon, demi-cannon, culverin, and so on. Whereas the poundage system has names after the weight of the gun. It's, but it's a little bit more than that. When the system was first introduced into England, it was introduced only for the army in 1639. And at that point, there was nothing between the culverin, 80 pounds, and the demi-cannon of 32 pounds. And the Navy and the Ordnance had seen the value of these middling 24 pounders aboard the, <coughs> the Netherlands ships in the First Dutch War. And in the mid 60s, they ordered their gun founders to cast iron 24 pounders to copy this. But none of these had arrived by this point. And in the meantime, they made use of the captured 24 pounders that they had in English service. So that 24 pounders we have are Dutch. The oldest was cast in 1600 by Conrad Anthony working at The Hague. The elaborate coat of arms shows it was cast for the city of Amsterdam. The second pair are both the work of Gerrit Koster, arguably the finest gun founder in Europe, working in the 1610s and 1620s. They were cast in 1616 and 1617, and again for the city of Amsterdam. What I understand is now just gone on display again at the South End Museum for when it reopens. And it is really very ravishing in its details. Here's a, some. It's really a work of art, that, that cannon. As I mentioned, the 24 pounder was a recent introduction and the ordinance had to make a number of adjustments to accommodate them. Dan Pasco has been able to demonstrate how the ordinance carpenters had to alter existing carriages to fit these new sized guns. In addition, they needed to find the ammunition of the right size. At first, they could use the shot that were captured with the guns, but in the long run, it meant having to order extra shot from English gun founders who now had to make new molds for this new caliber and then to get them to the depots. And we'll see a little bit about how the guns, the ammunition eventually reached the ships later in the talk. The next caliber are the culverins, which threw a ball of 18 pounds and placed on the middle deck. And I will cheat here because our surviving culverin was actually bored up to replace a 24 pounder. But it did start life as a short culverin in 1595, making this one of the oldest pieces aboard the ship. You can see with its Tudor rose. It was cast by the gunfighter Peter Gill, who had been apprenticed to the pits at Tower Furnace and had died six years before the London had sunk. In the last battery were the demi culverins and nine pounders on the upper deck. And we do have one of these examples it was dredged up in the 1960s and it's now on display at the Royal Armouries, Port Nelson. And here we've got yet another nationality, a French piece cast in 1636 by the founder Jean de Guillandol at Le Havre and complete with the name and arms of Cardinal Richelieu. Now it has an English weight, so it's probably been in English service for some time, presumably captured in the first Dutch wars. And again, not quite in the quality that you get in the Costa Gonda. So we come to the final third part. Why did the ordinance spend so much time and money trying to fish these guns out of the Thames? We've got a glimpse in this in the very mixed bunch of guns aboard the Thames, aboard the London. If a gun was 60 years old or a foreign calibre, there was still space for it aboard one of His Majesty's ships. This is just one aspect of the ordinance's need to keep track of the guns on the fleet. All ordnance was valuable and care was taken of it, and where it went was noticed. 
Once the Dutch wars began, the ordnance were continually writing to their gun and shot founders and the powder makers to hasten the work. And sometimes guns and shot were taken directly from the furnaces straight to the decks of the ships, rather than to the ordnance wharfs or stores, as was normally. The word that it keeps using in the ordnance is urgent. I want to give you a flavour of what things were like in the ordnance during these second Dutch wars and the lengths that they and their employees went to to keep the Navy supplied with working guns and powder and shot to shoot them. Through the war, the Ordnance's fleet of catchers, hoys and barks darted up and down from London and the Ordnance stores at the dockyards, not only ferrying new rounds of shot and powder, but replacement cannon, carriages and carriage parts and bringing back Within days of the four days battle, the Ordnance in London had a detailed list of the damage to the fleet's guns, which were sent on to the Navy. And once they knew what was needed, <clears throat> and you can see here some of the, the things. And one of the ones you get down the bottom is the St. George, which is one of the ships that was involved right at the beginning of the salvage of the London. But you can you see here the kind of large guns that are also being damaged. Once they knew what was needed, the ordnance clerks and storekeepers organized replacements. So on the 22nd of June, 1666, John Westall set off from Tower Wharf in his catch, True Love of Broadstairs, to deliver a cargo of 29 brass and iron guns to the ships riding at the buoy at Knorr. And they then loaded 13 broken guns and took them back to London on the 16th of July. So he was three weeks away at sea. Other journeys were more perilous. We've seen how bad weather hampered the public months in London. We also had the ordinance's little fleet of small boats. John Lettings left Tower Wharf in Constant Anne on the 30th of July, 1666, carrying iron guns and new carriages up to Southwold Bay. After delivering part of his cargo, he then took on a new load of ammunition and gunner stores from another boat and set off behind the fleet as far as the coast of Holland until the stress of weather forced him back to, Har <coughs> to Harwich, where he deposited the unloaded ammunition and took a new cargo back to Woolwich. He was away from the 30th of July to the 26th of October, almost three months trying to deliver guns. Mark Bagley's bark, the gift of Hastings, had an even more adventurous journey. He was also carrying guns, shot and tools from Tower Wharf to Seoul Bay. However, he was only able to deliver two guns aboard the Dragon before the fleet sent sail, with Master Bagley following behind as far as the coast of Holland, before he eventually reached safe anchor at Rye and returned to the Tower. That journey took him from the 19th of August to the 8th of October. However, not all completed their journeys. At least one of the ordnance boats was captured by the Dutch and the seamen paid for compositions for their months spent in a Dutch jail. And not all came home either. Lieutenant Thomas Fleetwood was praised for his great pains in the violent storm for preserving both the vessel he was on and the stores it carried. Sadly, in the course of this, he caught a cold and subsequently died of fever. So it is the widow Susan who received the reward. So throughout these years of the Dutch wars, the ordnance battled to get enough guns, ammunition and powder to the fleet. And as we see, not just when they were at port, but even in the midst of battle. To the ordnance, every gun, particularly every bronze gun was precious. In fact, following the war, the master gunner of England and a team of ordnance labourers were sent to Ostend to recover seven guns stolen from Chatham Dockyard and bring them home. To sum up, the armament of the London demonstrates practically how some of the guns on English ships were foreign trophies, while others were just very old, non-standard lengths or calibers. And the London also shows the importance of contemporary salvage. Cannon, particularly bronze cannon, were too valuable to be left on the seabed. The London quickly became part of the celebrity diver circuit, peddling their diving bells, tubs and tongs around the courts of Europe. Truly a case of have wreck, will travel from Stockholm to the Thames, up to the Western Isles and back again. But I also hope you've enjoyed hearing the stories of the, the lesser known folk, the seamen, the masters and the ordinary divers who worked on the river in these difficult years. I can't wait to get back to Kew and cover more of these lost stories. Thank you.
Thank you, Ruth. Uh, yeah, I, I feel your pain about not being able to to get to the archives to actually be able to delve deeper into the into the stories, um, particularly relating to obviously the you know after the sinking and the salvage of them. Um, of all the ones that we have, you've shown us there's the one uh, that has you say just gone back on display in South End for when they reopen. I'm sure Kira will talk about that later on today. Uh, and the one at Nelson. What about the others? Uh, is, is it possible for people to see them yet or are things still in conservation? The last time I saw the two English pieces, they were still in conservation. They were in big tanks at Fort Nelson, but you could physically see it. You could pour, peer into them. Oh, the okay. other two Dutch pieces, I'm, I have never seen at all. So I don't know where they are and what state they are. Presume they did both come back from America in the end, but yeah. I've not seen either of those except for the one that was on display last year or the year before at South End, the one the Dutch ones. Maybe that's a question for Historic England or the receiver of wreck, possibly, um, in terms of what ha what's happened to those and where they have uh, where they have gone, whether they whether they have come back from the USA. Um, Nick's asked, you talk of broken guns. Uh, would these have been blown up or is this just physical surface damage? Uh, it, they, they do a different, they use sometimes the word broken gun and sometimes the word damaged gun. I assume that broken means there's, there's a chunk actually off it. And if it's, I, and also the fact that they went out and brought them back makes me assume that they are, they are no longer in use. How they broke, if they were actually hit by guns by the Dutch or whether they have had some kind of gunpowder accident of their own. It, it, that doesn't make clear. But the, the, the two things are, they actually go out and fetch them. And I presume that partly, if they've got broken iron guns, they use those as ballast. And if they're broken bronze guns, they'd just be melted down and put in. In fact, it's one of the things that, the, the urgent bits that they have is to um, bring Oh, you know, they keep sending letters around to all the storekeepers saying, have you got an obsolete bronze gun? Can you send it down to Horseman and just you know, ASP? We have, a, we have a, a comment from Kira actually at the museum saying they do actually have two in store as oh, well, well as the one on display. Ah, oh, well, they're mystery solved. So you have got <laughs> all six of them are, are in public hands at the moment. Uh, absolutely. And uh, hopefully, uh, eventually, Kira, maybe you'll tell us later, hopefully all three will be on, uh, be on display. Ooh, that would be nice. Uh, that, that, that would be nice. So do, do attempts, do attempts to salvage the others that might still be lying on the, the seabed. I wrote down the number that might be something like 34, potentially, possibly. 34. Do, 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 potentially are there, 34. Are there others? Um, uh, what else? It kind of falls out of consciousness, presumably. People just forget that there's possibly 34 still there. I wonder whether it partly the, the Harrington one went on for something like 17 years, Ooh. between raising the guns and still trying to get payment. And that may have discouraged people from <laughs> doing anything legally. It, it may not have discouraged them from keeping an interest illegally. But um, I think after that, and I still would not, I've not been able to find out if Harrington ever did get paid for that. So it, it's, um, I think it's it's like all the areas with this sort of thing that it's it's slightly murky that there must be things going on, but uh, the the payment of government contracts as, well, as time goes by, wrecks get forgotten about because there's a new wreck, a new wreck with treasure or bronze guns or something that's going to be more valuable, and that kind of pro rolling program there's always something better, just for, easier to get as well. Of, of course, le less risky, um, easier location or easier depth potentially to, to get, or as you say, you know, richer treasure. Um, Except for, of course, for Tobermory that, that uh, I think in the, in the last 10 years, somebody's had another go at trying to do that again. Um, so Liz has asked what state they would be in on the seabed if they were discovered again. Well, they're bronze guns, and I, I presume if they're deep enough in the mud, they're probably in very good condition. You can see the ones that, that came up there, they're all fine. That they're, they're, I think one of the Dutch ones is so sort of slightly more raggedy than the others, but they, they're all perfectly good, nice Dutch. Well, the bronze guns, I think we'll all be happy to see them. <laughs> they're yeah. a bit worn, the, um, some of the, the marks that are a little smooth, smoother than one would like. But the, the Dutch ones were, I think, in much better condition than the English pieces. But then they're probably better founders. So. 
Yeah, uh, yeah, certainly, Liz. From my from my experience of uh, diving underwater on bronze ordnance, um, they can be in absolutely fabulous condition. Uh, you might have to um, take the odd barnacle uh, uh, off off them, but you don't have the same sort of level of incrustation or concretion that you'd uh, experience on the iron guns. Now, see, we've concentrated on the on the bronze uh, in terms of its complement, but then sh um, the London was also carrying iron guns as ballast. Mm, probably yes, I think so. Um, well, there's, as I said, that's exactly the sort of thing that where they're bringing those damaged guns all the way back that you can use as damage. Uh, well, they, they would be almost certainly English guns. Well, no, I, no, they could be Flemish guns that had been captured because what happens? You've got two iron industries at this point. You've got England and you've got Sweden. Sweden is supplying the Dutch. England is obviously supplying the English, and you've already got that backlog on the old guns from the, the first Dutch wars. And once a, a gun gets broken or, because at this point you can't melt them down like the bronze guns and reuse them. So the easiest thing is just to heave them in as ballast. So yes, there may be cast iron guns there as well, or bits of cast iron guns being used as ballast. Uh, well, I've, I've certainly, uh, having dived it, um, um, have been in on um, one of the sites, uh, site one, where, um, yes, you're, uh, you can almost stand in a scour uh, on the seabed and they are stand lying um, stacked on top of each other, um, long cylindrical, slightly bigger at one end, slightly <laughs> shorter at the other end, but very, very heavily con uh, encrusted, concreted. Yes, yeah, so we're probably uh, in a lot less good condition than the bronze pieces. <laughs> but... Of course. <laughs> uh, yes, most definitely. In, in terms of these, um, I don't know how much you um, have looked into the actual practicalities of the salvage that's undertaken. These tongs that you kind of use that you mentioned, are we talking like, I don't know, like a giant set of calipers that kind of grab round I think it is, yes. Um, it's one of the areas where it, it was a where you really need to be able to go out to a decent library, particularly one with 17th century books, and, and look through to see what sort of equipment they, they've got when you're sort of dependent or on your own library and what's on the internet. It's a little bit annoying. But yes, I, th I think that it, it's something like that. And they do seem to split. Again, it's one of those things I think that you really need to to investigate is that sometimes they're actually having divers going down in bells and tubs, whereas Harrington is definitely saying he wasn't diving, he was using some kind of grab. And, and they, they obviously they, are, they split into different methods of doing their salvage and how far you actually are doing diving and how far you're just grabbing. Yeah, much, much more. A really interesting future research because I'm guessing that the grabbers did a lot more damage than the divers uh, did. Yes, unfortunately, yes. When we when we look at the the state of the sites now, we wonder how much of it is due to the explosion and how much of it is a result of all the salvage mm. activity. Especially if you're not using divers and you're just sort of taking pot luck and grabbing what you can uh, and seeing what's in the bucket, so to speak, uh, when it hits the surface and hoping that it's something of value, not just a lot of wood and mud. Mm. Uh, well, maybe that's the subject for a future presentation for maybe next year, you know, uh, maybe someone from the Historical Diving Society linked to mm. obviously the research that's been done by yourself and others uh, onto the actual uh, guns that have um, come up as to the actual practical techniques of doing this, particularly in, in the Thames in such a tidal location. Okay, that's brilliant. Thank you so much.